very delighted to say that we are joined on the line also for this um, virtual iftar to uh, Dan Hannan. Hello, Dan. How are you? I'm very well, and it's great to see so many of my friends from the Muslims for Britain committee here. Salam alaikum to you guys. And I've, I've got to say, there's really, I mean, I think there's been a lot of online iftars and people have been doing all sorts of imaginative things during the quarantine. But I can't imagine that there are many others where actual <laughs> official hampers of exactly. iftar food have been distributed. Uh, Muslims for Britain, as usual, leading the way, leading the pack. Um, and but it, I, it, to make a sort of semi-serious point about all these dates and figs and, and so on that have come, it is a it is a reminder of a how important trade is, right? And this is a point that I think needs making during this epidemic. A lot of people are saying, oh, you know, the coronavirus shows that we need to be more self-sufficient. It shows that we need to produce more of our own food. Do you know what? It shows exactly the opposite. Uh, the, the epidemic hit in April during what's called Britain's hungry back a gap. The, the winter vegetables have run out. We're not producing any more potatoes or cabbages or turnips. We haven't had the first harvests yet. The global food markets worked beautifully. And if they hadn't, we'd have just been living on rhubarb, asparagus and nettles for the whole of the coronavirus. So, so, so trade is a good thing and importing things is a good thing. But it also, I think you know, a, a particular role for Muslims for Britain in this debate is to remind everyone, British Muslims and British non-Muslims, of the mercantile history yeah. of Islam. You know, and it was, it was that that first led uh, in the reign of the first Elizabeth, England into alliance with the Muslim states because we were having so many quarrels with neighboring European countries that uh, Elizabeth I reached out to the, the Moroccans and the, the Turks and the, the Iranians and said, you know, your enemy's enemy is my enemy. And by the way, let's do lots of trade. And uh, of absolutely. course, they all responded. Well, that's one of the things that's very sort of interesting. You're absolutely right. I mean, whilst we're having sort of quarrels with sort of Philip of, of Spain, I mean, Queen Elizabeth I was um, getting on very well with Suleiman the Magnificent and much else besides. But um, to, um, what, what was the genesis of your, I mean, you've written a lot about it. You, you've talked a lot about it. This relationship between Islam and trade and, and your understandings. I mean, first of all, how did you come to that? And, and what have you learned? Yeah, I mean, sometimes these things are more obvious if you like, if you're looking from the outside. So if you are brought up in a Muslim religious tradition, then the, the idea that the prophet is fundamentally a businessman and an entrepreneur and a trader is not the, the first thing that would strike you about him. It, it, it sometimes can be a little bit clearer if you're looking with some perspective. But it, it, it's an extraordinary story, and I think a neglected one, that... Uh, in the immediate aftermath, in the, in the, in the early caliphate, Islam created a, a global trading mm. empire based on, a, a, on a, a gold standard and based on free exchange, based on something very close to, to what we would now call a, a, a joint stock venture with limited liability in the, in the, uh, the camel trains. And, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence of this uh, uh, from the texts, from the hadiths, from from early history. You know, the, uh, when the when the prophet was in Medina, there was a, a scarcity, there was a food shortage, and and the leaders of the community said to him, "You need to tell them to to cut their prices in the market." But of course, he was a businessman, so he knew that that would be Absolutely. the wrong decision, and he is wow. reported to have said, "Provision is in the hands of God." Now, it took. Western economics, another thousand years to catch up with the idea that there wasn't an intrinsic price, uh, that a price is just th th what people should pay at that moment. And, yeah. and so why, why is this worth stressing? Well, I think that the, the, the forgetting of that tradition has deleterious consequences uh, for the world, not, not only in Muslim countries. I, I think... You know, the, the, the writer Ed Hussein talks about what he calls um, in, in the Iranian context, the red-green alliance. The alliance between uh, Marxist economics and kind of teenage anti-colonialism and religious fundamentalism. 
And in a softer form, I think this has infected a lot of minds. There's, there's a general feeling that you, you, come, you must have come across it reporting in the various places that you have around the world. In, in a lot of uh, Arab and other Muslim countries where people will say, free markets are a kind of Western thing. Yeah. Stock exchanges are a, an Anglo-Saxon yeah. thing. You know, yeah. The opposite, if anything, the opposite is the case. The real imposition on the Arab world if you're really looking for a kind of Western imperialism, it's not the stock exchange, it's Baathism, it's Nasserism, it's Arab socialism. And recovering the tradition of, of free markets, I think is a very good thing for the region and for the rest of the world. If you look back then through the sort of telescope of that, of that you know, very sort of rich history, and you're right, first of all, we, I should sort of join you in congratulating Muslim for Britain's amazing sort of hamper and incredibly well, well, I can't wait uh, to, to, to sample its, its goods, but it really well thought out in terms of its sort of linkage between this country and its trade with um, uh, the, the nations of which is, the produce is, is represented in that hamper. Looking back through the sort of telescope of history, what about our relationship now, you know, moving forward uh, with post-Brexit with the Muslim world? I mean, how do you... How do you sort of see that? Do you think this is a sort of opportunity within the context of sort of global Britain? Do you, do, are you, I mean, you know, because there, there are a lot of sort of um, issues, shall we sort of say, in, in, in the Muslim world that, 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 would, that, that could block that. I mean, how do you see things? Sure. Well, it's a really good question. Uh, I think, first of all, Britain, <clears throat> of course, we are partly a European country, but we've never been only a European country, and particularly we are linked by migration, by history, by language, by law, to every continent, to, to, to English-speaking Commonwealth countries uh, all over the world, many of them Muslim-majority states. <clears throat> and so this is not, you know, if you like, this is not a new question. Mm. Uh, it was very striking when we relived the centenary of the First World War, as it were, in, in real time, that the, the British Army, in 1918 looked a lot more like the Britain of 2018 than the Britain of 1918, right? So, the, 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 you know, at that time, the vast majority of British subjects were neither white nor Christian. This, this is not a, uh, a, a, an unprecedented. But, you know, I think we could have a great role again as a center of Islamic finance, as a, as a center of trade, as a, a, a place where uh, continents meet. But it is also partly a question of what happens in various Muslim countries. I, I think it, I, I don't talk about the Islamic world. I think it's a, you know, we're talking about <laughs> billions of people. But I'm very encouraged by the story. We're coming up now to the 10th anniversary of the guy who began the Arab Spring in Tunisia, Wazizi, the market trader, right? Yes. A, a great inspiring story because his was fundamentally a battle to make a living. Property rights. Yeah, right. The, the freedom to enjoy his own stuff without interference from a corrupt government. Right. And I think almost everyone can relate to that story. And, and certainly his story is absolutely rooted in the Muslim tradition. Right. Going, uh, again, go, you go right back to the first caliphs, uh, to, to Omar, to, uh, you know, to, to Abu Bakr, who, who, who say, we do not have authority except in so far as we're doing the right thing. The law is above me. You know, uh, Umar publicly punished his sons to show that no one is above the law, right? And similarly, Bouazizi was saying, just because uh, you're in government doesn't mean that you get to push me around outside the rules. And he was, of course, driven to the hideous mm. extreme of self-immolation. Yeah. But in the end, people rose up all over the, the region in favor of liberty and property. And I think that's, you know, as a, as a free market conservative, I regard that guy as a hero. But I think, you know, if, if I were a free market Muslim, I would feel so even more, right? Because he was doing so very, very much within the tradition rooted in his own soil.